you are his friend and you are joining us on the phone, which is wonderful, and we welcome you. And I think those of you from TMKC who are here have heard him speak before. He is, his claim to fame in my mind is that he's very good friends with my son, Benji, although his uh, talents and abilities go way beyond that. But to me, the most important thing is relationships ever <laughs> that tops anything and so that connection and that relationship is, is something I value tremendously uh, and I feel very fortunate that he and I have been able to keep in touch I always say um, I, I don't think I've ever said this to Menachem but I think I've said to Benji you know when you're in Israel it's nice to know there's another young from man that you know texts me and keeps in touch on it, who's not so far away so um, and we had the good fortune to finally meet each other several months ago when he spent Shabbat with us, which was a really special treat. Um, and what was really kind of fascinating to me beyond the personal was that, or beyond the, uh, yeah, beyond the personal was that he, while he and Benji are both um, from and they both travel, you know, travel different paths uh, in becoming where they, to go where they are religiously, in fact, they're part of different from communities. So, um, you know, I think people, if they go anyone in a black hat does everything the same, but of course that's not true of anyone in a black hat more than anyone without a black hat. Um, but in fact, you know, he is from part of a Hasidish group and Benji is part of what we would call a Litvish group. So while they have very much in common and it doesn't affect the friendship in any way and they study together, it was fascinating to me to talk to someone from a different community and learn about that community. Um, but tonight he's going to talk about something that we all know about, but we will learn about on a, a deeper and a different level, which is Tu Bishvat, which is, uh, we usually refer to it as the birthday or the new year of the trees, because simply saying the 15th of the month of Shabbat doesn't sound very glamorous. Uh, and it is a time that we celebrate and connect with the trees and nature. Um, when we've been together over the years, we've had really fun two bitch spot staters, which I miss tremendously, and hopefully soon we'll be able to be back together and doing that. Um, so tonight, uh, and just to remind everyone, two bitch spot actually uh, begins on Sunday evening through Monday. It, it coincides this year with... Um, with Martin Luther King Day, just by pure coincidence. And also, as a little trivia, it corresponds with Betty White's, what would have been her 100th birthday. Um, so it, it's a significant, she actually was very into animal rights and animal advocacy, which isn't exactly the same as trees, but, you know, all part of God's creation and all part of nature in various ways. So in my mind, all these things coinciding as kind of just a fun coincidence, or one might say for share. So anyway, we are not here to hear me. I am going to turn on the recording, and I think we lost a couple people, but I'm assuming they will come back and we will let them back in. I hope I didn't scare them off by my talking. And um, here's Renee, it's right back. And uh, turn it over to Menachem. Okay, and thanks. And now I'm going to be recording. Okay. Recording in progress. Okay, thank you so much, first of all, by Robin, for those warm, those warm, warm words of introduction. It's actually very funny, as you were saying, I did not think about it as Martin Luther King Day, although there is obviously a lot to talk about on Martin Luther King Day and its connection to Tu as we could discuss, obviously. But really, I want to focus on a little bit of a different point this year. The point I wanted to focus on is more, uh, once again, as you mentioned, as that's the Rosh Hashanah, the new year, the birthday of the trees. That this is the time of year that we celebrate the trees, nature, the environment, and all these types of things. Now, thinking about it, obviously from a religious point of view, what exactly is the source? Where do we find such an idea, such, such this, this idea? Where does it come from? Where, is, where do we find such things as we have a new year, a birthday that we celebrate, a day we're celebrating the trees, the environment, the grass, the stuff like that? So what really is the deeper meaning involved in this? Uh, now, as well, once we, as we're on the topic over here of discussing trees and the environment and those things, this year has another very unique aspect to it, and that is this year's what's called Shemitah. Not sure if, um, Rabbi, if you mentioned Shemitah at all. I don't think I have this year, actually. So Shemitah, so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so very important. Shemitah is that the Torah actually tells us that, that for six years you're going to work the fields, for six years, 
You're going to go, you're going to harvest, you're going to plant. But the seventh year is the day, is a year of rest. The same sort of system as you have by Shabbat, Shabbos, right? You have six days you work, the seventh day is a day of rest. So we have the Shemitah. Six years we work the fields, the seventh year is a year of rest, so we go back to study, we go back to studying the Torah, the Talmud, everything, and we go, we, it's a year that we think. We think about where is this, where's this food coming from? Why is that the other six years we have food? And it reminds us to think about God, think about Hashem, think about what He gave us. It's a year of reminder. And though it's not really enough to just have the reminder, it's not enough that we're just thinking about it. There's another step we have to do, the next step. And what's that next step? The next step is you have to think, God. You have to think, Hashem. That's the next step. So, so really, Shemitah is more than just the year of rest. It's the year of gratitude. And that's really what I want to focus on the next few minutes, is this idea of gratitude, of, think, of thankfulness, of thanksgiving. What does it mean to have gratitude? What's the importance of gratitude? And how does this connect back, really, to two Ishra, the holiday that we're coming to celebrate here? Although Shemitah is also very nice. But really, Tu is what we're really here to talk about today, so let's try to connect that. There is a fascinating Pelayoit. Pelayoit is a book from the mid-1800s written. It's a Muslim, an ethics book. It's a very sharp book, a very scary book to read, because a lot of the stuff written inside of it are very sharp to the point, direct. And it makes a person shiver, and it really brings in self-thought to a person. A person has to think about well, I, maybe I shouldn't do the sins, you know, it, it adds a bad thing to sin. And this book is discussing the idea of a person who denies them some of the good to them. What's called a kafay tov. A person who turns away from the good and doesn't acknowledge and doesn't thank the person for the good. And over there, it starts off by discussing this person who denies the, bad, the good and, and it's only focused on the bad, but then it turns. And it discusses a whole new idea. It discusses the idea of gratitude. And it brings up something very fascinating, and it really has to do with the Torah portion these past few weeks. Which again, I don't know which parts of the Torah portion you've discussed in synagogue the past few weeks. But we had the ten plagues. And interestingly enough, in the first few of the last of the ten plagues, one of the fascinating things that happens is we find by the first plague, by the plague of blood and by the plague of frogs, we find God tells Moses, you're not going to be the one to, to, to go cause the plague to come. Your brother Aaron has to do it. Now, a question on this, why not? Moses is the leader. Aaron is the leader. But Moses was the real leader. Moses is the one we're looking up to. Moses is Moses. Moses is the great, the great leader of the Jewish nation. He's going to be the one to take the Jewish nation out of Egypt. And yet, Moses, you're not going to do it. Aaron's going to do it. Why would that be? Why would we think that we'd have to have that, that Aaron should do it instead of Moses? And this we're going to come to the Pelioids. And he explains it like this, that we know from the history of Moses, and we followed Moses' life, we know, we learned some very important lessons. One of the big lessons we learned in Moses' life was the lesson, well, was, let's go back first, let's take a step back to the history of Moses. What was the history of Moses? He's born, and the Egyptians wanted to kill him. No, no Jewish boys are allowed to be born. So what do they do? They put him in a little... You know, something, a uh, makeshift boat, some sort of thing, and they let him loose in the river. And he's sort of floating around the river, and his sister's standing to watch him, obviously. We're all familiar with the story. So Moses got saved by the water. And because he got saved by the water, God said, you have to learn to appreciate. You got saved by the water, so now you don't go and you don't fight against the water. You don't go do something against the water. You don't cause the water to now go and to harm people. You don't turn that water into blood. Why not? Because you have to show your appreciation. You have to show your gratitude to that which the water saved you. And the same thing with the frogs. You can't cause that the frogs come from the water because you know what? The water saved you. So you see that it's such a great thing, this gratitude. It's not enough that you have to show your gratitude to people, to God, to anything like that. No. You show your gratitude to the water. The water saved you. You've got to thank the water. You've got to make sure of it. In fact... Many of us are familiar with the custom to recite a blessing. When one passed by a place where a miracle happened to him, any time he passed by that place in the future, you have to commemorate it. You have to thank it. Thank God for that means. You go and you make a blessing at that spot where it happened. That's the way it works. Also, something fascinating. Also, this idea of gratitude. But there's more to it. There are so many times we find gratitude. There's so many different stories of people who show their gratitude. And not only did 
Their gratitude is shown appreciation and went to the next step. Because of their gratitude, it turns to save them. You know, the story happened in 2001. Two women were on vacation in Israel. These women were co-workers. They worked together in the big office in Manhattan. 2001, they're in Israel. They want to go into the pizza shop. It's a borrow pizza shop. They come in, about to order pizza. While they're there waiting for the pizza, the waitress tells them, you know, it's very crowded today. There's no seats available. So why are you waiting in the, sh- in the pizza store? Go outside. You'll be able to uh, breathe a little. You know, it'll be a little more relaxed and it'll be more enjoyable. Okay, and then I'll come outside to call you in. So they thanked her profusely for this offer. Very nice or very kind of her. So they went. Very nice. They'll go outside across the street. About a minute after they get out of, outside across the street, they hear a big loud noise. Turn around and there's a bombing. It's a viral pizza shop. Team is bombing. They're shocked, shell shocked. Oh, look at this. We just got saved. He says, go think. It's, who's this way? They go. They run to the scene. They take a look. They see the waitress is there. For the remainder of their trip to Israel, they see she's alive. They go to the hospital every single day to go visit her. And they became friends. Before they left back to America, they went to visit her. They said, this is our number. Please, 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 we want to stay in touch with you. You're our new friend. We want to stay in touch with you. We owe you appreciation for our life. We'll do anything to help you. About a month or two later, they get a call from this friend of theirs. Guess what? I'm coming to America next week. I have an operation on this day. Please come and uh, please, I want to meet with you. They said, okay. They both tell their boss. They worked in the same building. They both told their boss, we can't come in that day. We have to go. We have to go meet this person. We have to go see her. You know, it's our friend. We have to meet with her. Fine. They come to the, they come, they come to the hospital. A few minutes later, they get, the, they get the news that they're building 9-11. It was 9-11. Their building that they worked in the World Trade Center was destroyed. Look at what the value is of appreciation. By them showing their appreciation and keeping up with this woman, their life got saved. She saved them once, and look at that. Later on, many years later, well, not even many years, a few months later, their life got saved the second time. That's what happens because they show their gratitude. That is the power of showing gratitude. But there are many other stories of gratitude. You know, there's a famous story of Rais Shal Gustman. It was a famous Rosh Hashiva, dean of a prominent yeshiva in Israel. And every single day, he used to sit outside watering the plants. You know, eventually, his students went over to him. He said, you know, the rabbi should be learning. The rabbi should be studying. The rabbi should be speaking. The rabbi should be doing so many things. Yeah, the rabbi makes time every day to go and water plants. Isn't that a waste, seemingly a waste to the rabbi's time? <laughs> what do you think you're doing over here? He said, let me tell you a story. Before the war, I was walking with my rabbi, my rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Ozergerzinski, who was the leading rabbi in pre-war Europe, one of the leading rabbis in pre-war Europe in the Lipnish communities. But he was held up unanimously by both the Lipnish and Hasidic communities. He was considered to be the leading scholar of that generation in that pre-war era. And we were walking Shabbat afternoon. We were taking a walk together. And we walked to the forest. And as we walked into the forest, you know, we come to the first place and... He points out, this plant's edible. This plant, it tastes good if you put it in soup. This plant tastes good like this. This plant's poisonous. Don't eat that one. This one you should roast. This one you should do this. And he's giving a list of different things. So, you know, why does the rabbi need to tell? Okay, I'm not going to ask questions. doesn't ask questions. Fine. Let's go. Okay. Very nice. A little bit later, came war, the war, World War II broke out. Rabbi Sol Guzman relates that he went and he hid in the forest in war struck in Europe. And as he hid in the forest, he survived off his knowledge of the plants. Every day he used to eat different plants. This one was nutritious. This one wasn't. This one was. This one wasn't. He planted this one, didn't plant this one. This one he put in soup, and he's able to survive the war. And I said, now that I come out of the war, I cannot take the plants. I only survived this war because of the plants. And now you expect that I should go and just forget about them? No, I have to show gratitude. Because that's the way of a Jew to show gratitude. But you know, it's really not only about this. I want to leave this for a minute, and I want to discuss another custom that we find on Tulishra. And again, this is a very custom that's spoken about many times in the Hasidic circles and the Hasidic communities. I don't know if it's spoken about in other communities. And that is the custom to pray for an esrog. What? Yeah, to pray for an esrog. We pray that we should have a nice esrog this year. You know, when we shake our, our date palm and our myrtle branches and all these other things on Sukkot, we also should have a nice esrog. 
That's what we're doing today? That's what we're praying about? What is this idea? Where does this custom come from? So now the custom to pray for it comes because there's the idea that this is the Rosh Hashanah for tree. And for the plants, you know, the first time we find mention of Tu'u Sha'arli, coincidentally enough, is in a Mishnah. We don't find mention of it in the written Torah. We find it in the Mishnah, the oral law. It's the first mission of, Rosh, of Tractate Rosh Hashanah, which discusses Rosh Hashanah. It says there are several Rosh Hashanahs during the year. And there's an argument, what is the first Rosh Hashanah? It's disputed over there. Is the first Rosh Hashanah, is, what's the Rosh Hashanah for the trees? Is it the Rosh Hashanah? Is it the 15th? Or is it the first of Shabbat? And it's disputed over there. That's the first time we find mention of this idea. But once it's a Rosh Hashanah for trees, we're going to pray also that it should be nice. The same way you pray a Rosh Hashanah, that it should be a nice year for us and the year should be good. So too, we're going to pray that the fruit that we're going to use for our future mitzvah will also be nice. But where does this idea come from? We have to have a nice ethrog? Like, who cares? The difference, you know? You know, this one has one spot on it, this one has two spots on it. This loves a little bit more green, this one's a little bit less green, this one's a little dark. Where did this idea come from? So, actually, once again, we could look at this week's Torah portion, Parshas Peshalach. And we discuss the Jewish nation going out of the land of Israel. And one of the things they do when they leave the land of Israel is they cross the sea. And afterwards, they sing a song of gratitude. And there's a verse there. When they cross the sea, one of the verses in the song they sing afterwards is that Kiliyan Veil, that should be a very nice. Now, this verse, the Talmud, several places, uses to explain to me the idea of that when we do mitzvot, when we do the commandments, we have to do it the nicest way possible. Although over there is being used to praise God for our leaving. Egypt. Well, on that note, by the way, leaving Egypt, another idea we could t- connect it to gratitude. In prayers, many people say multiple times a day, they say this song that they sing, they sing in the morning prayers. And after the Shema, multiple times a day, people say different prayers commemorating our leaving of Egypt. Now, why it is that we're having such a focus to this leaving of Egypt? Why do we focus? Why do we care so much? You know, that happened uh, 3,000 years ago. You know, I should still be busy with this now. Couldn't you think of something better? You know? Let's commemorate other things. Why are we focusing on this? But the reason that we're focusing on this is because this is really what made us into a nation. What created us and made us into the Jewish nation is our leaving Egypt. That was step one. We're no longer slaves. We're no longer part of Egypt. We are a new nation. We are a unique people. The sons of God. That's who we are. A special people. Okay. So now that that's the significance, of course we should commemorate it. Let us thank God for giving us, making us his chosen nation. Let's thank him for bringing us so close and for caring so much about us. Of course, that's something we should do. But back on what we were saying, this verse teaches us the importance of always making sure to do the mitzvot in a nice way. And really even the idea of an estroke. There's a story said over, a beautiful story, once again by the period of the Second World War. At the very beginning of the war, the story happened with the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Not the previous one, but the one before him. The Rebbe Riyas, as he was called. And the big Lippish Rav at that time, the big Lippish Rabbi was called the Brisker Rav. The Rabbi of the city of Brisk. Or by Soloveitchik. And the Brisker community is famous for their extreme scrutiny in keeping the, in the, in keeping the mitzvah. They do everything to the highest level possible. They, such detail makes a difference to them. And they will go to extreme levels to make sure that they will never do something wrong. And everything has to be to perfection to the highest level possible. So, the brisker wrote by the beginning of the war period and he obviously he wanted to get a nice Esther. So, well, Baba Jarebi, the Rebbe Riyat, wanted to do what he could to help him get it. So what did he do? He decided he's going to go and he's going to ship over an Esrog uh, for the brisk girl. Now it's war starting. Bombies everywhere. So he's got to be crazy, you know, for attempting to take this risk. And now he's going to go and he's going to bring an Esrog, but he's going to get an Esrog. Now you can't just go with the Esrog. You have to find a way to get it and safely. You have to find a way to get it from one place to another place. So one of his students volunteered that he's going to be the one to be the messenger. So the Rebbe Riyat, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, sent a message. This is where we're going to be at this time, this night. I'm going to be over here, this and this place. Come find me. 
you'll pick up that string and you'll bring it to the rabbi in brisk. Okay? Very excited. So he comes 9 o'clock to go. He gets to the door, knocks on the door, starts banging on the door. Someone answers up. I'm sorry. The rabbi Riyadh had to move on. It was getting too dangerous from over here. He said, this is this location. What's the next location? You know what? I'll catch him over here. He gets there, and they said he just left five minutes ago. He has to go to the next location. And he's going around, finally, 11 o'clock, two hours later. He finds the, the Rebbe Riyadh. Okay, he gets the Esther. He's excited. He's going to be the one to bring it to the big rabbi and brisk. He takes the Esther. He goes with it, and he travels to brisk and brings it. Throughout the way, there are bombings happening nonstop. He has to go hide every two minutes. Either way, a trip that was not supposed to take so long, he got there at 4 o'clock in the morning, delivers the Esther to him. He, got, he was ready to die to do this. Who would think? What's the significance of doing such a thing for one Esther and a nice one? The Elbavitcher Hasidim have a custom to only use certain Esther, so only from certain locations, because they say it's even nicer. So they're going to such crazy extent to get this nice Esther, they couldn't do anything less. But no, that's what they're trying to show. They're trying to show the idea and the importance and the value of every little mitzvah. Even a nice esrog. They're going to try to do what they can for their nice esrog. So when we come to Tulisha, that's obviously something we have to pray about. Let us try praying for a nice esrog. Maybe this year we'll have a nice one that we've ever had before. Or maybe it'll be something else. Both bring us back together. We said before, we spoke out when we crossed the land of Egypt, when we crossed over Egypt. Now we're learning this whole thing out about the night nice Esther. We're learning from the fact that they crossed over the, the, the Yom stuff. They crossed over the big Red Sea. God saved us. He helped us cross over. And we thank God for it. Now this idea of gratitude over here, and I'm saying to thank God, but it's more than just thanking God. The idea of every thank you. I saw a beautiful story. All right, Pesach Krom, a well-known order in the Orthodox world. He's an order, an author, goes around to speak in many places. He said that one time he was in the airport for a flight. And he was running to catch this flight. He's running, running, running. He makes the flight, goes on to the airplane. Amazing. To get to the airplane, two security personnel come on, board the flight, and they start walking up and down. He sees everyone staring at him, getting nervous. What are they coming after me for? They go to him, they say, excuse me, sir. Yes? <laughs> you know, how can I help you? Did you lose your phone? Excuse me? Did you lose your phone? He goes, he starts checking his pad, he's looking. Yeah, you're right. I lost my phone. He goes, but how did he know? Is it because you know my rabbinic garb? He's dressed in his rabbinic garb. They said, no. Because throughout every single person there, you're the only one to say thank you. And because you said thank you, we made sure to remember you. The idea of gratitude is a big thing. It's not something that should be taken for gratitude. One thank you mean you will never be forgotten. One thank you can mean you could go so far with that thank you could accomplish so much of that thank you that your life could be saved, as in the Sabaro Pizza Shop, one by 9-11. The power of a thank you. Who knew that I could do so much? One small world, one small word can make a world of a difference, could change your entire life, and could even save your life. There's many people of the custom when they wake up in the morning, they recite a prayer Modani. Again, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Rabbi. I don't know if it's something you've spoken about before. But um, no, you know, and we don't, we actually don't, we're, we're usually not together in the mornings, but oh. when we are, we actually, that's not part of our, the liturgy that we do. Okay, so I'll bring up the idea. Obviously, I'm not telling anyone that they have to do it. I don't want anyone to feel that I'm enforcing our religious practices or anything like that on people. I bring up the idea that, many, that there's a custom brought down that many people, when they wake up in the morning, they wash their hands. The first thing they do is they wash their hands, but then they recite this prayer, the Moda'ani prayer. And the Moda'ani prayer, which is really only a few words, maybe a, a dozen words. And what this prayer is, is that it's a prayer of thank you. Thank you, Hashem. Thank you, God, for helping me wake up in the morning. Thank you that I can get a whole brand new day where I can go and I can accomplish so much more. Thank you for the amazing day I had yesterday. Thank you for the good night's sleep. Thank you for everything. That's this prayer. It's that small thank you, these small thank yous, that these small thank yous could change the whole world and could change the life. That is the power of a thank you, and that's the power of gratitude. And really, I believe that is what Tuvishrat is all about. Tuvishrat is a time to come say thank you. Yes, 
thank our family and friends, but also thank God for the beautiful, amazing, delicious fruit he gives us throughout the year. And thank you for allowing me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask if anyone, I think it's okay with you, if anyone has any questions sure. or comments or, or thoughts they would like to share. And um, that applies not just to those on the video, but if anyone on the phone wants to say something, you just can push star six, which will get you off of, I believe, take off mute. But we'll start with Ellen, who I see her hand is up. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and speaking to us and uh, sharing this um, message of gratitude. So greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity once again and to come share some words that hopefully we could all use, myself included, to hopefully grow and to continue to grow, to grow further from here. You know, it's interesting because in the, the non-Orthodox world, um, and I myself, I, you know, have studied and I'm very into mindfulness meditation, but a lot of that is about awareness and gratitude. And, you know, I'll talk to people and they'll say, well, it's really important to do that. And I say, I agree, but, you know, that all exists in Judaism. And, you know, I'll often meet Jewish people doing that and not realizing that blessings have that exact same purpose. You know, like that you talked about a bit of like, you know, I think a lot of I, the way I understand blessings is that they are meant to make us stop and take notice and thank God, you know, not just pass by a rainbow or pass by a tree or have a drink or, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, I often use the example of a blessing I personally don't say on a regular basis, but there's one for going to the bath, you know, after you go to the bathroom. And, you know, I'll tell this to a bar mitzvah student or about mitzvah student and they'll kind of giggle and laugh and I say, you know, it's often not until you've had trouble doing something that's supposed to be a very natural thing that you appreciate when things work out okay and things do come naturally and then you do feel that sense of gratitude and you know sometimes you, you're very fortunate or spoiled and that things come easily to you with your body functioning and you know as you start to get older though you realize that things don't always function the way you would like and then you feel this amazing sense of gratitude for so many things that we take for granted and, you know, the way I, I understand blessings in many ways are to, is to stop and, you know, using mindfulness language to stop, to know this, to be grateful, uh, and to thank God for these things, which, you know, it, it, it sometimes amazes me that, that so many liberal Jews, my peers who I come into contact with, are like, oh, I never thought of that. Or, you know, I, I don't, I didn't realize Judaism had that built in. And I was like, that's such a, you know, such an essential part of what, Judaism is, is, you know, the reason we say uh, traditionally you're supposed to say 100 blessings a day is not to torture you, but really the opposite is to make you realize uh, the beauty and wonder of the world around and not be focusing on the negative per se, but to really focus on the positive and all the gifts God gives us. So I, I thank you for, for um, talking about that and, and, and bringing that to our attention. Thank you, Rabbi, for those comments. If I could add in one point. There was an idea brought down in the Talmud and Tractate Brachot in this, I believe it's the beginning of the sixth paragraph, if I remember, in the sixth chapter, if I remember correctly. And over there it has a phrase, a very interesting phrase, that's forbidden for one to have pleasure from this world without making a blessing. Now what's the meaning? The Talmud goes on over there to explain that if a person does not make a blessing before they eat, they don't think about what they're doing, they don't think about it coming from God, it's like you're stealing from God. Step one is, Sit back, think for a second. God, you're the one who put the fruits in this world. You know, every day by lunch, I try to eat a fruit because it's very healthy. And I was thinking today as I ate, I today ate a pomegranate, which obviously as two a shot comes along also, there is a custom. Again, I don't know if you're familiar with the idea to eat from the seven uh, unique, the seven fruits of Israel. Shiva Hamim, the seven fruits that are brought down. And one of the things, I, you know, I had in mind today is when I made this blessing, I was thinking of the pomegranate and I thought about it, you know, many people also symbolize the pomegranate that has 613 seeds, which is, symbolizes the 613 commandments, mitzvot. I was thinking about it, you know, there's so much to it, there's so much little details, so much, there's so much I have to thank God for. How, how come we just run into it, you know? It's like the blessing, you know, I just got to make the blessing and I'm saying as quick as possible. No, let's sit back and think, there actually is a deeper meaning to it. 
And it's really funny when you think about it, it changes your whole perception of the entire world. The entire world becomes a new world. Rabbi, you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> Another teaching which I had never heard before, which was really interesting that you mentioned in the beginning about Moses and the water. Because um, obviously water plays such a crucial role throughout the Exodus story from the very beginning, as you noted, with Moses and his teva and his little basket floating and Miriam watching over him. And then, you know, as you said, in the um, ten plagues, and then as you mentioned again, Moses, you know, when they crossed the sea. And, and in fact, um, Parsha Shalat this week, the one that is a, about the parting of the sea and the Israelites singing. And then um, even beyond where you were, we're talking about, obviously, <laughs> obviously, you know about it, but didn't have to do with the speech was then, you know, as they're wandering in the wilderness, and they run out of the water and the Israelites fetch. And then according to the Midrash, the story that Miriam is followed by a well of water and Moses strikes, Moses speaks to a rock to get water and then he strikes the rock to get water. And, and just so much of his story is about water, but I never, ever heard the part about that's why he's not the one to turn the water to blood. And that's not why he, he does the plague of frogs. I, I found that fascinating. Just I never is that in the Talmud that teaching? I'm not sure what the source is. I quoted it from the Peleolus, which is a mid um uh, mid eighteen hundreds book. But I believe there are earlier sources to it. I just don't remember the earlier sources. However, I will add to what you're saying about ideas. There's obviously the question that Moses got punished when God told him to talk to the rack instead of hitting the rack. So why was God that's punished? <laughs> why was God punished? I'll say it's in the same book where I saw this. I will quote also that the reason God got punished was because Moses, Moses, Moses got punished. The reason God punished Moses is because of this reason that because he got saved so much by the water, he can't now go hit something for water. He should have talked it. The same thing, it's a lack of gratitude. And that was what the punishment was all about. The same thing, there's a lack of gratitude. Once again, we see the importance of this gratitude. I like that because I always have trouble. I mean, I think it, for most of us, it seems like a very harsh punishment that he's not going to enter the promised land because he struck a rock, um, you know, with, with all that he's done. And obviously there are many reasons why, you know, it's time to turn it over and not everyone, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, in pure care, like it's not your responsibility. It's your responsibility to start, but you don't have to do the entire task. And there are many explanations as to why Joshua would be an appropriate leader at that point. But I think Moses' punishment seems particularly harsh. So I like, you know, that, that idea of connecting him with the water, it, it I think is a, a little bit better explanation. It makes it a little more palatable as to, to why Moses is punished when you recognize the good that the water has done for him. Well, there are two other ideas in the Thank punishment. You. That number one in the punishment is that well, many times the people who are the super righteous, God judges them much more harshly because much more is expected of them. A person on top has higher expectations. A person on the bottom has lower expectations. And when you have higher expectations and you're a bigger person, yeah, the punishment will also be bigger. But at the same time, there's another idea, and that is, I think we mentioned this idea also earlier the previous time we met together, was that there's an idea of this world and the world to come. And many times to the righteous, God will give them a harsher punishment in this world, that that way when they get to the world to come, they can go straight up to heaven without having to go through the, the, the period of suffering over there and the period of punishment over there. So they'll already be pure when they pass away. And therefore, right away, they go straight to heaven without having to wait. While a res regular person would have to wait, let's say, 11 months, or whatever it is, they can go straight. That could be another reason why. That one I find harder personally, theologically, to accept. Um, but it, it's interesting, <laughs> I'll say. Any other questions or comments? Anyone on the phone? I just don't want to miss anyone. Yes, thank you very much, Menachem. You brought out a very strong point. I was just wondering, that you said that yeah, you kept your gratitude. Moses couldn't be the one to bring the, pla the plague onto the river because he was saved through water. Yeah. I don't understand. What type of gratitude could water have? Water is not a person. Water could accept gratitude. I understand you give gratitude to a person for speech, thankfulness, something like that. So what, like, how do you have gratitude to water? 
So this is something we mentioned in the beginning briefly. Let's go on more a little bit to explain it a little bit deeper. And that is, obviously on a simple level, it doesn't have feelings. You know, they say when a person goes fishing, a fish does not have real nerves. And therefore, I should be allowed to go just catch fish and throw them back in right away, right? I should feel to go catch and release for the fun of it. But no, yeah, such yeah. a thing you don't do because such a thing would not be right to it. It would not be... The idea is you're still going to cause it a harm. Water might not be able to feel something. It might not have feelings. It might not have anything. Although if you want to go according to Kabbalistic ideas, now obviously these are not stuff that we can understand. These are not stuff that I claim to know or understand. There is an idea that there are angels representing different things. But again, I don't know what this means. I'm not going to understand this. These are stuff that are a supernatural stuff that are beyond the regular, my basic small amounts of knowledge that I may or may not have. But the idea is a water, and even if the water itself doesn't feel, there's still the way a person is supposed to act. And the way a Jew acts and the way you show gratitude is not by harming this water again that went and saved you. And it has nothing to do with the water feeling. It has to do with how is the proper way for me to behave. What do I do as a Jew? What do I do if I want to serve God? What is the proper way for me to live my life? And the proper way for me to live my life is, yeah, I keep into consideration the water. The water saved me. And therefore, the water saved me. I don't now go and harm the water. Whether or not the water is going to feel it, it doesn't matter. That is what it means to have proper gratitude. Very nice. What you're saying basically is that this whole thing of gratitude is for me, how I'm supposed to act, how a person is supposed to act. Yes. I believe that's a very big part very of it. Very nice. Yeah, I'm good with that. Very nice. Thank you very much. You brought out an amazing point. You're welcome. Any other questions? Alan? Um, you explained that beautifully, but I just want to ask you, um, does this have any relevance? The fact that water is God's creation. We're just thankful to God for all of the creation, including water. Would that be a part of it? I'm sure it's a very big part of it. I'm sure it's a huge part of it, but at the same time, there are certain things in God's creation that we could use for our purposes. The same way we could drink water, maybe since God also would say to bring the plague, to bring plagues out of the water, maybe we should be allowed to do it because it's also coming from God. You know, there's a famous story. Actually, this, uh, I think it was last week, was the anniversary of his passing. The Rebbe Reb Zisha of Anapoli was one of the great Hasidic leaders, him and his brother, Reb Eli Melech of Lejen were probably the two most favorite, the two most famous and well known of the of the in the Hasidic cultures of the of the leaders of the early leaders after the Bashem to the founder of Hasidus. And in those days as was common, they used to try to find excuses to throw other Jews into jail. So they got accused of something and they got thrown into jail. And as they're in jail, they're sitting in the prison cell, every prison cell had its in those days a pail which was used for people to leave themselves. Now when a person is not supposed to pray when there is stuff that are unpure next to them. Because that's not respectful to God. So comes time for the afternoon prayers and Rebelli Melech of Lezhensk starts crying. So what's he crying about? He said he's crying over the fact it's time to pray. And he's not able to pray now. So they said back to him, his brother Rebzisha of Anapoli said back, the same God who said that you have to praise the same God that said that when there's dirty stuff in the room, you don't pray. So with that, they started singing and dancing around this pail. And soon the entire prison's laughing and everyone's going crazy. The guards got very upset. The guards said, what does that mean? People are enjoying themselves in prison. So the guards went, they took the pail out of prison, and they went back and they were able to pray. This, has, this story illustrates the idea and the point of a person that many times there are things that God tells us to do, and then God will tell us something else to do. We have to know is what does God want from me now. So by Moses, he could have said that what God wants from me now is for me to go turn the water into blood, because that's why he wanted to punish the Egyptians. But no, God told him, you have to learn what it means to have gratitude. And gratitude means that no, you're not going to go now, and you're not going to go uh, turn the, the water into blood, because 
That's not the way you act. That's not what proper gratitude means. Instead, what are you going to do? You're going to let your brother Aaron do it. So yeah, there is an idea that it comes from God, and we have to appreciate it with that. But sometimes God will say, right now there's something else that matters. And therefore, right now, what we have to do is, we have to know what our purpose is right now. And right now, what's our purpose? Right now, your purpose is, would have been to turn the water to blood. But here, because of gratitude, no, Aaron's going to have to turn it to blood. And that's not for you to do, because you have to show your gratitude. Did that explain it? Definitely. So, can I ask you about the etro? I thought I found that also interesting. I did not know that. Um, you know, I know that we are supposed to, with the lula and the etro, find you know the nicest, palm, the, the nicest palm, the nicest willow, the nicest myrtle, and the etro. You know, the finest etro that smells the best, and all of those things. So it makes sense to find the best etro. Um, and in fact, I remember last year when I went to buy a lulav and etro, there were like, this is the cost for a lulav, the etro costs X or X, depending on if you want a good, uh, it's kosher no matter what, they're both kosher, but if you want the really good one, it costs more. Um, so my question is, though, why the etro gone to Bishvat? And you did touch on it, but I'm just kind of curious. So if you look at the Mishnah, the, fir- the earliest source we have to two Bishvat, the earliest source we find says that it's, the, I'm going to quote the, the words to you and I'll translate it, Rosh Hashanah right. which means that it's the new year of the trees. I have to interrupt you one second. So Benji's middle name and his name is Binyamin Elon, because his birthday is January 27th and he was named, he was born near Tubishva. So we thought Elon was perfect because it's the birthday of Elon, oh, the trees. Yeah. But he hates it now because Elon apparently, while a popular Hebrew name is not a popular from name. <laughs> so he, he hates his middle name in Hebrew because it doesn't fit. You know, Binyamin, bin, Binyamin can be Binyamin, but Elon is just modern. <laughs> Too modernish for him. Yeah, well, it's not a common name in these circles. But yeah. Rosh Hashanah Lilano, yeah? So, and Elon is a tree. The way we, we represent, we find trees represented is by the stuff that comes from the tree. What comes from the tree? The fruit, the fruit that grows on the trees. So that's why when we use the term esrog, now I don't think it's just an esrog, I think it means all the different stuff. I think it means your myrtle branch and your day palm. I think it means it all that you're supposed to praise to have a nice yep. one. But the way we view it and the way we're going to refer to it is by the fruit, because the fruit is what symbolizes the tree. A beautiful tree is the tree that has fruit on it, not one that just grows big and strong. You know, a cedar tree is a great tree. It's a big, strong, powerful tree. By the end of the day, the cedar tree lasts for each generation, but after that, it's gone. A person, they say, people are compared to a fruit tree. That a person's goal in life is to be like the good fruit tree. They go, they fertilize, they have kids, they have fruit. Future generations, future comes out of it. Every fruit has seeds inside of it. The seeds then go and they make more trees. That is the power of the fruit tree, and that's the deeper meaning of fruit. So especially on Tuvisha, it's a Rosh Hashanah for trees, but also to us should symbolize something. That it's symbolizing a rebirth, a future a regeneration, you know, especially as we're now in this COVID era, we're in this pandemic going around, a lot of people are very unsure. What's going to happen? What's going to be the future? What's going to be? Think about the fruit tree this year on Tuvishra. That's what you should be thinking about. That, yeah, there is a future. Don't worry. Yeah, right now we may be here busy with the fruit trees. We might be busy with, we might be busy in this world. There might be a crazy world, all the fights, this, that. But don't worry. A better time is going to come and things will happen. The world is going to keep going on. That's why we have a fruit tree and that's why it symbolizes in fruit. Do you think there's any, like, Madrasha connection, and this might be pushing it, but I know, you know, in America, most Jews assume that the the pre, the fruit on the tree in the Garden of Eden, we all say it was an apple, which really comes from Christianity. And in Jewish tradition, the Midrash says that it's an etrog. So I was wondering if there's any connection between that, because you're talking about the future, but I wonder, and I could be pushing this, but if there's any connection between that really in the past, in the Garden of Eden, by stressing the etrog on Tupishvat as well. So it could be for that, I can't tell you for sure if there's an answer. I could tell you though the track that the, the Talmud and track that Brachol also, it lists several different ideas for what it is, for what type of fruit it is. Now everyone says the apple, the etrog, but also brings up maybe it was wheat or maybe it was grapes. Mm. Why grapes? Because grapes, because we don't find that people could, 
We don't find that people um, do bad things until they're intoxicated. Wine intoxicates people. That causes bad things. Or it could be that it's something else. Or it could be wheat. But the Talmud ends off with something very interesting. And it said, and all the different commentaries on the Talmud over there explain it, that the Talmud does not give an answer to what it is. It gives a lot of ideas. But then it says we don't really need to know. The question is, why do we not need to know? You would think this should be something significant in our history. You know, from the Garden of Eden, the thing he ate, the tree, from the tree of knowledge, you know, the thing that destroyed the world, destroyed society, caused the changes that we're now stuck with. Every bad thing that happens in the world is because of that. Yet, we don't know what it is. We don't know what caused it. If anything, you know, I want to go near it again. I want to touch it again. I wouldn't want to eat that fruit. But that's the lesson. That, yeah, it could be that fruit was the one used. But no, there's nothing wrong with the fruit. There was nothing wrong, and therefore we can't forget it. We, don't, we should not focus on the past. The idea is the future. Where am I going from now? Where am I going in the future? It's not about the past. It's about the future. How will I keep going? Anyone else? Thank you so much, Rabbi. You really brought out the depth of what the gratitude is supposed to be, especially when uh, in common to the depth of just thinking about how Moses is able to stop himself from bringing the makot to the water. Um, and now we'll have a whole new positive picture in what the upcoming ceremony of Tuvishad is going to be. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and I hope it didn't. Uh, I hope you were able to gain a lot from it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it was so nice to be able to see you this time. It was uh, an extra treat. So um, hopefully I will get the recording in a day or it usually takes like a day and be able to share it with lots of other people who couldn't make it. And you. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Rabbi. It was amazing. Thank you once again for giving me the privilege of coming over here once again to come join. And hopefully we can use this as an opportunity to continue growing together and hopefully come closer to God through it. And we should all enjoy our Tuishat and hopefully focus on growing over Tuishat. And remember the fruit and remember the future. And it will be a whole new Tuishat experience this year. Amen. <laughs> I have nothing to add except for amen. I really, it was, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much once again. And, uh, Everyone enjoy the rest of your week, and I will see our TMK Sears on Shabbat in a couple of days or evening. Uh, I guess thank you. About 48 hours. Well, thank you, Menachem. Thank you so much. Thank you for arranging all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the privilege of being Hello. here. Again. And Rabbi, if you want, I could send you the text. I don't know if you have the text of the mode. Recording stopped. What's the, I'm sorry. The, the text of the mode. Just, yeah. The text of the mode of the mode no. prayer. I don't know if you have the text. I know it. <laughs> oh, you know it. I wasn't sure. I could send it out in case anyone's interested in seeing it. Oh, yeah. No, it's not on the door. We just, when we do our um, service, just for time's sake, we haven't been, we haven't included. I kind of also, the canner and I inherited the service the way it's been done, and we haven't, you haven't changed ever it changed it. But, um, you know, it's a beautiful prayer. It's, uh, a very special prayer, yeah. Very important. You know, well, interesting, you. an interesting fact about the prayer that I once heard is that I heard from my biology teacher back when I was in Nair Israel with Benji, and that he said when you think about a person when they wake up in the morning, they should, um, they're supposed to sit up for about two seconds and then get out of bed because of the blood rush. So the custom in the Orthodox world is that when you sit up, you say modani. It's the first thing you do when you sit up. It takes about two, three seconds, whatever it is to say. It's a, it's a dozen words. And then perfect. By then, by the time you're standing, the blood flow is perfect. Just an interesting thing I saw about it. Right. It is, uh, it's nice to begin the day on, I think, a note of gratitude. And, again, the same as any gratitude throughout the day, but to, to start your day with that mind, you know, something as simple as saying a, a brief prayer and starting the day on a positive note. Yeah. I think can make tremendous, instead of like, oh, my gosh, I have so much to do, or what am I going to do, you know, whatever the case may be, <laughs> depending yeah. on. Definitely. What your day ahead is like. It definitely it makes a big difference. Making your bed. <laughs> exactly. It definitely makes a difference the entire day. And then also from that point yeah. onward, since the entire day is going to start on an idea of what could I do to grow today? How can my day be different? What am I going to gain today? And add a whole deeper meaning and a whole new meaning to your entire day. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Toda Rabba.
There was a time in my life when I did not, I was not grateful for the day, but every day I am grateful. Thank you for sharing, now. yes. The special day, every That's day is a special day. thing. Yes. Yes. I'm gonna to close it out, unless anyone has anything else they wanna add, but otherwise I, uh, I hope we'll see you soon. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a have great night and enjoy. Week. And enjoy your and tea, I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. Yeah.